Greetings in that strong and blessed name of Jesus. Welcome to Fully Alive. Fully Alive is an outreach ministry of the Church of God of Cleveland located at 11100 Union Avenue. Well, praise our God. Amen. Uh, today, uh, we're studying, amen, uh, the gospel of Luke. Amen. And uh, we're looking at the Luke chapter 4. Uh, our focus is going to be on verses 1 through 13. We're looking at the temptation of Jesus. Amen. The temptation of Jesus part 3. Amen. Well, I'm going to read the first uh, those first uh, verses there. Um, and Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness, being 40 days tempted of the devil. And in those days he did eat nothing, and when they were in it, he afterward hungered. And the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command these stones that... Uh, command this stone that it be made bread. And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Well, praise our God. Amen. And the devil taking him up into a high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee in the glory of them for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will, I give it. If thou therefore wilt wish me, all this shall be thine. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan. For it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shall thou serve. And he brought him to Jerusalem, and set him on a pinnacle of the temple. And said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down from hence, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee. And in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against the stone. And Jesus answered and said unto him, It is said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And the devil, and when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him for a season. Well, praise God. Amen. Uh, in part one and two, uh, we found that Jesus was the Son of God. Amen. In the flesh. He was God, but he had put on flesh. He was fully God, fully man. Amen. And that flesh part of him made him a man. And all men are tempted. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, no temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted to be young, that you are able, but with the temptation will provide a way of escape also, that you will be able to endure it. Amen. The Bible lets us know in Hebrews 4.15 that Jesus was tempted in all points like us, yet without sin. For we have a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Jesus was a man. All men are tempted. My definition of temptation, a temptation is when you and I are encouraged to fulfill a God-given natural desire in an unlawful manner. Encouraged to fulfill a God-given natural desire in an unlawful manner. The temptation is never a sin. No matter how evil the thing is that you attempt it to do, it becomes sin only when you yield in thought, deed, or action. The song says, yield not to temptation for yielding is sin. There is no deep spiritual experience that you will enter into on this earth that will make you free from temptation. I said there's no deep spiritual experience. 
going to make you free from temptations in this life. Jesus, the Son of God, was tempted in all points like as are we, yet without sin. And so he knows how to carry us through. Amen. I want you to keep in mind that Satan tempts you with a view toward your stumbling and falling. God may test you with a view toward building you up, making you stronger. Sometimes it may be the same circumstance. Satan tempts us through three areas. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. In 1 John 2, 15 through 17, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but of the world. And the world passes away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. I place Jesus' first temptation in the area of the lust of the flesh. Jesus was very hungry. That was Satan's approach. And when you talk about lust of the flesh, we're in the area of food, in the area of sex, in the area of pleasure. Jesus was very hungry. That was Satan's approach. Jesus answered Satan with the word of God. Verse 3 says, And the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command this stone that it be made bread. Verse 4, Jesus answered him, saying, It is written, that Man should not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. I place Jesus' second temptation in the area of covetousness. Lust of the eyes or covetousness was a very real temptation to Jesus. Covetousness appeals to our humanity. That's why so many folks are playing the lottery. The lottery, amen, is motivated by a spirit of covetousness. Now, some are working two or three jobs depriving their family of their quality time. They don't have time for church, prayer, a Bible study, trying to keep up with the Joneses. Covetousness. Covetousness is the second of the seven deadly sins. The Apostle Paul put covetousness on the same level as idolatry, Ephesians 5, 5. Covetousness is an allegiance with the false god mammon and Jesus said you cannot serve these, you can't serve God and mammon. Today our focus is on Jesus' third temptation, which I place uh, under the pride of life. Now, don't get me wrong. The three temptations are interconnected because uh, they're of the world. And not to some degree you can place either one of these temptations in any one of those three categories, okay? But uh, this is where I'm impressed to move, okay? Well, praise God. Now, reading from the Amplified Bible, in John chapter 2, 15 through 17, well, I want to just read verse 16, Amplified, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, craving for sensual gratification, the lust of the eyes, greedy longings of the mind, and the pride of life, assurance in one's own resources, or in the stability of earthly things. These do not come from the Father, but are from the world itself. Well, praise God. Jesus knew who he was. He didn't have to prove anything to Satan. And we've already found that, according to Amplified, the pride of life, assurance in one's own resources are in the stability of earthly things. Jesus knew who he was. He knew uh, the scripture that Satan was, was quoting. Amen? He could have been prideful and thrown himself down to prove a point, but he did not. 
it was possible that if Jesus had given into his humanity through pride, the fall could have killed him because he would have been out of the will of God. His death would have been premature and would not have atoned for our sins. But praise God, Jesus knew who he was. Amen. And though the temptations of the area of his humanity were real temptations, uh, Jesus trusted in and relied on the strength of the Holy Spirit and the word of God. And that's what you and I have to rely on as well. Well, besides that, God the Father had already declared that Jesus was his beloved son in whom he was well pleased uh, when Jesus got baptized. Amen. And so, uh, so here we see the devil approaching him. If you be the son of God, <laughs> cast yourself down. And God's angels will take care of you. A spirit of suicide. Cast yourself down. That spirit of suicide is running rampant. Amen. And, 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 and you know, I think there's a relationship with suicide and pride. Amen. I believe that suicide is selfishness and prideful uh, there is help available for you uh, but you've got to humble yourself uh, you've got to admit that i can't do it i need help amen you got to be willing to share it with someone amen uh you can't be so prideful that i can't tell you what's on my heart it will make me look foolish um, you need to humble yourself amen you need to admit life is too hard for me okay I need help. And you can start by crying out to God. Oh God, I need help. May the Holy Spirit help me. And lead me to the right person. He will. There is help for you, okay? Well, praise our God. Listen. Satan was quoting from Psalms 91, verses 11 through 12. That scripture applies to all God's faithful. Because God has assigned us... Uh, angels as ministering spirits. Well, praise God. You remember when Peter uh, got out of jail and he was knocking on the door and Rhoda was so excited. She come back and she didn't open the door. She went back and says, hey, it's Peter. And they said, no, it's this angel. You know, they believed that uh, God had an a, a angel uh, that he'd assigned to Peter. We believe that there's an angel assigned to each of us. Now, that doesn't mean you need to go trying to try to talk to angels, communicate with angels, because you're going to get a hold of a demon. Probably. Okay? You want to talk to Jesus. Amen? You want to read the word of God. You want to rely on the Holy Spirit. Okay? There are folks who want you to think that they're so spiritual. <coughs> they want to talk about, well, you know, I talk to angels. Well, I talk to Jesus. Okay? Well, praise our God. All right. Amen. So, so Satan was saying, okay, cast yourself down. You know, the angels will, will take care of you. Amen. And you can prove right now that you're the son of God. And that wasn't the way that God wanted the world to know that Jesus was, in fact, the son of God. God's plan was that uh, the world would come to understand and know that Jesus was the blameless son of God through the miracles wrought, through the suffering he endured uh, from Gethsemane to the cross. God wanted people to know that uh, Jesus was the blameless son of God through his death, burial, and resurrection. And that's why the Bible declares in Romans chapter 1, verse 4. <coughs> excuse me. The Bible says that Jesus was declared to be the son of God with power. According to the spirit of holiness. By the resurrection from the dead. Amen. When the Holy Ghost raised Jesus from the dead. That was a declaration that Jesus was indeed the Son of God with power. Well, that's how God wanted uh, the world to know that Jesus was the Son of God. And the devil was trying to cut these things short. Well, praise God, Jesus knew who he was. Amen. And the Bible declared that Jesus answered again with Scripture in Luke 4, 12. And Jesus answered and said unto him, It is said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Notice, 
thy God, because God is Satan's God. Well, praise our God. And that is indeed the truth. Amen. Well, hallelujah. You know, um, Satan has a tendency to take good things of God and pervert them. Amen. Uh, yeah, he's the perverter of the truth. Amen. Um, he, 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 for example, you know, uh, he takes sex, a beautiful thing that God has created to be uh, enjoyed uh, in marriage. Okay. Marital intimacy. Okay. He perverts it and it becomes the lust of the flesh through por pornography, uh, premarital sex, perverted sex. Okay. He's taking something that God has given that's good and beautiful and pervert it. Amen. And we told you that temptation is when you are encouraged to fulfill a God-given natural desire in an unlawful manner. So we see there's a lawful uh, gratification and there's an unlawful. Okay. So, or he takes, amen, uh, the natural desire to improve oneself uh, and one's circumstances. And he perverts it and it becomes covetousness or an out of balance desire for gain. Amen. Yeah. And same with pride. There is uh, uh, a God-given pride that's good. What do you mean? Uh, I believe that it's all right to have pride in oneself. It's all right to have pride in uh, one's accomplishments. It, it's all right to have pride in one's appearance and so on. Amen. Nothing wrong with that. Amen. But what Satan wants to do is pervert that and get it out of balance. Amen. And then it becomes the pride of life. Well, uh, uh, three things that's in the world, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. These things are in the world, not of God. Okay. Well, well, well. So, so what happens then once this gets perverted, amen, it becomes boastful pride. You know, I'm better than somebody else. I look better than somebody else. I sing better than somebody else. I drive a better car than somebody else. I, my wife is prettier than his wife. And it becomes boastful pride. It becomes arrogant pride. It becomes better than others pride amen well praise our god okay and so and so amen you begin to compare yourself to others you begin to judge them by how much better you sing how much better you preach how much better your car is, you know, uh, I drive a new car every year. My house is $300,000. And you begin to uh, look down on people in your heart because of your blessings. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I told you that uh, in the last guy used to preach at the rescue mission, and they told me that when you preach, you know, uh, we can receive that because we don't sense that you're looking down on us. But other preachers come in there and we sense that they look down on us. And people can sense that, okay? Because in your heart, you have pride. And you are looking down. And you think, I'm better because I live in a nice house. I'm better because I sleep in a nice bed. I'm better because I drive a nice car. None of those things count for nothing because at the foot of the cross it is on level ground. Yes. Yes. So we need to be careful. So the enemy will take something good. It's good to have pride in who you are in your work ethic and in all other things. But but because God don't want you to be uh, ungrateful. Yeah. You, you, you need to take a little pride in yourself. Okay. But it's out of balance pride. It's it's the pride of life. It's, it's when you look down on others. Amen. Okay. When you think you're better than others. Okay. When it impacts your attitude toward others, then you got a problem. Okay. And parents, 
that attitude can be passed on to your children. And, and, and you may not realize that you're walking in it yourself and you're passing things on to your children. Just like I said, those folks in the rescue mission, uh, they could sense some things. Those preachers probably didn't realize they were passing that on. Amen. They may not even realize that they had allowed pride to come in their spirit. It's kind of like the disciples. Uh, when Jesus was on the Mount of Transfiguration, they couldn't cast out that demon. They have allowed unbelief to come into their spirit, and it wasn't working for them. It worked before, but it wasn't working for them. They couldn't cast out that demon. And I'm just saying, that's the way this pride works. Before you know it, it's got a hold on you. And your children is picking up. You know, when, uh, when I was dating my wife, I had a high school diploma, but... Uh, I come to realize that she had a master's degree in library science. Uh, she was a published author. And she was in Who's Who Among Black Women. And uh, her circle of friends were a totally different circle of friends than I had. And so I had to deal with the issue of, can I handle this? Uh, well, here, here's the point. I, I decided I could handle it because she was a humble woman. She was not lifted up in pride. She was not looking down on me because... I only had a high school diploma. <laughs> you know what I mean? Praise God. And she was humble. And that's important. Amen. Be a proud of your accomplishment. And see yourself as someone. And remain on that upward mobile scale. But don't get lifted up in pride. All right. Well, praise our God. And now uh, we have what we call uh, 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 class warfare, you know. Uh, their political ideology of class warfare. And so people becoming conscious of, well, you're in that class because you were wealthy. And, and, and you know, even though they, they worked hard and earned that, they, they just want to judge people because you got money and they judge you. And, uh, or they become pride because I'm broke. Or, and we're in that area of, uh, uh, Pride based on skin color, you know. Um, you know, when we were coming up, if you were white, you were right. But now, <laughs> it's reversed. If you're black, you're right. A uh, person of color, and if you're white, you're not. And so, well, again, all I'm saying is that we need to be careful because uh, pride based on skin color. Judging and condemn, condemning others based on if they are people of color or white. Political ideology, like critical race theory that begins to teach the little kids uh, that, uh, you know, white folks are prejudiced. <laughs> Even at four months old. <laughs> uh, and these things are dangerous, okay? And all I'm saying is that pride, pride is working in a very deceitful way. And pretty soon we're teaching our kids and we're passing things on to our children and our children are growing up uh, with the this pride. They might know, may not know it. So you get into class warfare, you get into uh, race warfare. So, so yeah, uh, pride, pride of life. Satan takes something that's good and he perverses it. Like some people believe that uh, it's sinful uh, to be prideful about anything. It's out of balance pride that God is against. Okay? Well, praise our God. They don't even want you to be proud that you're a Christian or proud that you're American or <laughs> well, praise our God. Nothing wrong with pride that is balanced. Okay? All right. So, what does the Bible has to say? What does the Bible have to say about perverted pride or the pride of life? What does the Bible have to say? Well, Pride will bring you to destruction. What do you mean? Because uh, God is against pride. Okay? And the Bible says in Proverbs 16, 18, 19, pride goeth before destruction and a haunted spirit before fall. Yeah, it's going to bring you down. Okay? <laughs> and and uh, that pride is going to lead you right into it. Okay? All right. Well, praise God. Pride goeth before destruction and a haunty spirit before fall. Yeah, because these guys are all caught up in themselves. They think they're better than each other. 
uh, somebody else. And they're not going to be uh, uh, listening to sound wisdom. Uh, yeah, that pride is going to lead them headstrong into destruction. And uh, that honey spirit, <laughs> yeah, it's going to lead them right into a fall. Yeah, praise God. Verse 19 says, Better is, uh, is it to be of a humble spirit with the lowly, with the lowly, than to divide the spoil with the proud. Yeah. Amen. A humble spirit is what God is looking at because he hates a proud look. He hates that prideful spirit. Listen, uh, Proverbs 6.16 talks about there are things that God hates. Amen. Yes. It says, uh, in fact, the scripture says in 16 through 19, there are six things. These six things does the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination unto the Lord, and the first one is a proud look. And somebody says, well, I hate a liar. Well, uh, God hates a proud look first, and then a lying tongue comes, okay? And hands that shed innocent blood, third. A heart that divides wicked imagination, feet that be swift and run into mischief, and a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among brothers. And all these things are bad. The very first one, though, that God hate is a proud look. Hmm. Yeah, I tell you. And then, and then uh, the Bible goes on to let us know that God will resist you uh, if you walk in pride. First Peter chapter five, verse five. Likewise, you younger, submit yourself unto the elder. Yeah, all you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. Humility, for God resists the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Yes. Praise our God. Okay. God resists the proud. God will resist you if you're proud. See, a pride, a pride will keep a man from acknowledging his need of a savior. Pride will keep a man from humbling himself and crying out to God to save him. You know, God is calling you to humble yourself. Uh, 1 Peter 5, 6 says, humble yourself therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Amen. The Bible is teaching us that you and I must humble ourselves before God. Now, are you are waiting on God to humble you. No, 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 no. Because if, if you want God to humble you, you may not recover you. Re, 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 you may not recover. God says, humble yourself. Okay. Now you can ask Him now. Oh God, you know, I, 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 I break the power of this pride in my life. Oh God. Help me to humble myself. Now, God will help you, but uh, but it's on you. Humble yourself, the Bible says, under the mighty hand of God, and he will exalt you in due time. You must humble yourself. God can't do it for you. Now, you can ask the Holy Spirit to help you, but you must humble yourself. Matthew 5, 3 says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And somebody says, what is poor in spirit coming to that place where you recognize you don't have anything to offer God. All your righteousness is filthy rags and you come poor. I'm in abject poverty when it comes down to anything good, Lord. I bring myself to you and I, I humble myself. I humble myself before you. Have mercy on me, oh God. God will have mercy on you. God will have mercy on you. Well, praise our God. Father, we ask you to bless. You take this simple word and use it to your glory. And we pray that someone will cry to you in humility and ask you to help them to humble themselves so you can break the power of pride in their life and deliver them so that they can serve you faithfully. In Jesus' strong name, amen.